so we're about ready to go. Thanks for joining us, people. Yay! Yay! I had a total heart attack. Uh, I just flew in from Montreal. My my calendar had the wrong uh, had the wrong uh, time zone. And uh, at eleven ten this morning, I looked at my calendar and said the this panel was happening at eleven a.m. Oh. <laughs> That's how my day typically. I wonder if yours goes similar and how that affects the business. The travel always affects these things. I, you know, I, you know, I, I did a convention in Ohio and I showed up. You know, you get, you know, you know, you know thing? you get to your hotel room, you open up your luggage, and there's that sign in it that says the, the, the FTA has gone through your luggage, you know, and, and like, my French maid outfit's missing. I hate that. I hate that. All those repertories. Oh, oh, yeah. Left the heels. So. Okay, so uh, thanks for coming, folks. My name is Warren Lanning. I'm probably the lowest paid voice actor on this panel. <laughs> and that's, uh, I'm certain, not an exaggeration. And uh, I'm going to allow these gentlemen to introduce themselves real quickly. I, I know you've probably read some of the uh, uh, what the information is in the brochures for the event. But you've got some really great talent here that done some really great things. I'm going to move with Dom. Why, hello there. My name is Dino Andrade, and I am a voice actor. <laughs> Which is to say that I perform all the voices you hear on radio, television, theater, video games. <laughs> Not all of them, of course, no. Only the good ones. <laughs> hello, hi, I'm Dino Andrade. I'm a voice actor. I'm a, uh, I'm, uh, let's see, I'm a scarecrow. I was the uh, Scarecrow in Batman Arkham Asylum. Uh, I'm a uh, Legator, Nimrod, Professor Putricide, the Death Knight Gnomes, the Mad Bomber, all those guys in uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, I've been Pop for uh, the Rice Krispies for Snap Crack and Pop. I'm um, uh, Sophia the First, uh, Shimmer and Shine, the stuff for ABC Mouse. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty busy with Call of Duty and Legend. I do a lot of stuff. So, that's me. Done. Cool. Hi, everyone. I don't have that same introduction. No, I don't have that. That was nice. Uh, my name is Dominic Catrimone. Um, most recently, you maybe uh, maybe heard me on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles playing Leonardo. Uh, I was that guy who was between Jason Biggs and the other one that's on there. <laughs> Seth Green. Uh, yeah, Seth Green. Not that I guess did. Um, they uh, they needed to replace Jason Biggs, uh, and uh, they needed somebody who could come in and sound like him and keep that character consistent. So I got an opportunity to do that. Uh, I did 32 episodes with them, um, eight as uh, as the hero on my own. I'm on many other things, video games. If you go to Florida, I think it's I'm doing some interactive stuff with them, and toys, and all sorts of fun stuff. So it was really really an amazing ride uh, to be able to, to have an opportunity to do that. Um, I also uh, uh, was Micro Ice on Galactic Football, if you remember that series, and SD Gundam, Ashura, Ashura Bond, that guy. Uh, I got to play him and uh, like nine other people on that one. Um, and uh, you, I, I do a lot of promo work, so uh, the other thing that you maybe have heard me do was uh, I was the uh, promo <coughs> Voice for five years for Disney XD. Coming up next on Disney XD. Who's <laughs> that guy? <laughs> awesome. So I'm borrowing money from you. <laughs> uh, I did that. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's just it's it's really cool. I'm, I'm currently working on a uh, 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 I'm the voice for uh, Fox uh, Bullseye. Uh, the promos oh, for, yeah. for that show. Good show. Yeah. Bullseye. That show. And, and it's, it's Fear Factor, actually. It is, it's Fear Factor. But it's like yeah, extreme, extreme stunts. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, and I'm working on a DreamWorks uh, animated uh, TV series right now that I really can't talk about. Like, oh, I heard about that. that. <laughs> I heard about so, that. It's, it's NDA, right? Yeah. That's, I, yeah. I've worked on that show too. NDA. Yep. Yeah. NDA. Non disclosure agreement. <laughs> but I am allowed to say that. We always tell a bitch. What we're doing. There you go. Brian. Uh, I'm Brian Peacock. Currently, I play Snitch on uh, Doraemon on Disney XD and uh, Walker what? on Disney. Yes. Disney on Disney XD. Thank you. Uh, Walker on Dorara and um, 300 years ago, I had my first job uh, as Takato in Digimon. Digimon Ooh, Tamers. Yeah. Uh, 
on Chica, on Bleach, and Sa on uh, Ukon, on um, Naruto, and uh, Battle Beatamon, all kinds of stuff. Um, currently, I'm heard in a bunch of uh, elevators in the Midwest or um, <laughs> terrible uh, local car commercials, things like that. Um, I used to be the voice for, um, we'll be right back, I'm Fox Kids, and then they went out of business. And it wasn't my, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't my fault, it's it just took the money around. Um, and then currently I'm, I'm producing, and have, have produced an eight episode zombie comedy web series called Acting Dead, which is about actors whose lives are so terrible that they kill themselves to become zombies so they can then be cast as zombies. <laughs> and you can find us on, uh, uh, online at actingdead.com and we're currently working Studios to take that to television. So, yeah, that's awesome. Beautiful. Kyle. Hi. Uh, Kyle Aver, I'm the voice of the narrator in Gohan on Dragon Ball Z, Aizen on Bleach, Kiba on Naruto, Ryu in Street Fighter, Kami on Lagan. I'm currently a host of a weekly podcast on Geeky News called The Big Ball Broadcast on Kevin Smith's Smodcast.com. And I'm happy to be here today. Yeah. I'm Robin Ashley. <laughs> okay. Are you new uh, new add on, Robin? I'm Are you new add on? They didn't tell me you were joining on. Are you here with us? I'm a what? Are you new an, an addition to this skill? I guess they didn't tell him that you were going to be on the panel. Oh. Oh, awesome. All right. All right. I'll See, I told you how my mind started. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, so, Robin, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. I did the voice of Lord Zed on Final Monkey Power Rangers. I've got a thousand more films. I don't want to bore you. The reason they make more money than I do is because I only did the voices in my own products, and that guy paid horribly. <laughs> and, uh, and I did that because I never wanted to pay SAG and get in that uh, situation. Which is a whole other story that uh, someone can yell at me for later. <laughs> but uh, which then eventually led to you know some TV roles of actually playing myself in animated shows that I don't remember the names of because they were that memorable. But uh, and then I actually started getting paid, which was funny. But that being said, it's great to be here with these guys. And how many of you are considering amping up your voice talent and careers and things like that? <laughs> all right, all right. How many of you do it already? Yeah? How many of you get paid to do it? <laughs> okay, okay. We've got some income rolling. Come on up. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna give you Can you money. tell us how? All right. <laughs> royalties if we can be helpful folks. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is great and I think the, the biggest questions that, uh, that that I got from people earlier I was asking you know what would you like to hear from these folks and uh, the one that always comes to mind first. Boxers. <laughs> what? So when did you guys realize that you might one day be a voiceover, that you might one day be doing character voices. When, was the, when did it occur to you? When you were children? When you stepped into the wrong room for a job application? What happened? <laughs> I can answer that. Yep. I was doing an on-camera job, uh, a children's after-school special in 1980, and in the next studio they were doing an anime. Uh, a series called Banner of the Squirrel for very young kids. So I I went in and uh, asked the director if I could audition. I said, I'm working next door. And, uh, she said, sure. So I got the role of Banner of the Squirrel, and that's what started it. <laughs> and I was lucky enough, it was lucky enough to be a time when anime was just starting to blossom in Los Angeles. So uh, it snowballed from there. I found some art productions and worked in them for about nine years. And the Power Rangers came into that home and took it from there. So it was, uh, I had it in the back of my mind that I was, I was mainly a uh, film and TV and stage actor. 
I have a pretty similar situation. I, uh, I, I got my classical theater degree and was out here 20, almost 20 years ago doing stage and TV and film and stuff like that. Little, little things here and there. And then uh, I had a, a manager who had a relationship with a, with a top PO agent in town and they started kind of hip pocketing me, which just pretty much means they send you some auditions, they're not officially signing you, they're just kind of seeing, you know, feeling it out and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was very fortunate to book some stuff. Uh, I'm from Chicago, so my very first job was doing uh, radio commercials. My dad's in the audience, by the way. Right there. <laughs> splinter, kind of, kind of splinter. <laughs> and uh, uh, you may remember this, but I, I booked some commercials for Carson Perry Scott and some other, like, department stores in that area, and I just thought that was the coolest thing, that I was out in LA, and my parents are gonna be able to hear what I do, and it's all validated now, like what I do actually makes sense. And, and then I just kinda, from there, just, just uh, started looking into that, and took some classes, and and uh, pursued that, you know, I kinda rode the wave. I, I, I didn't come in, I never give anybody advice about anything, but this business, which is so varied, not just the but just the entertainment industry, it's, it's you know, if the wave comes and, and you feel like being creative, ride it. Ride that wave and see where it goes because who knows? I mean, that, sticking with that, not going, well, I don't know, I'm a stage guy, I'm a TV guy, you know, that gave me the opportunity to do everything I do right now and, and live a you know, life that I enjoy. It's creative and, and uh, yeah, so that kind of where it started for me. Similar for me too, I was a, a theater guy who did tour of Les Miserables and stuff, and I was in LA doing a, a play where I played 38 different characters, but with no makeup and no costumes, just all in the face, going back and forth. It was really cool. And a friend of mine from Universal was then directing Digimon, Mary Elizabeth McGuinn. And she came and saw the show, and she thought, you know, I have this new part coming up for season three of Digimon, you might be right for it. So I didn't know what I was doing at all, but she, she threw me a bone come and audition. So I auditioned, of course, you know, five months later, you find out that you were the part. And I got the lead in season three, and literally from that show, jobs have come. Connections, friends, studios. Most of the time I work without having an agent. Um, in fact, a couple years ago, I couldn't even get an agent, and I was on five series, but that's a whole other story to talk about. Um, so it was kind of like right place, right time, being prepared, and then plucked. When I was a when I was a kid, I, I became fascinated with uh, audio production from the creative side, not the technical and the whole writing and performing and so on. Uh, one of the things my, my parents used to collect and give away my HOA eight tracks of of uh, old radio shows, uh, the the Abbott Costello shows, the Life of Riley, all these things that I, I used to love listening. In fact, I still do. I can find a lot of them online now. And uh, my father had gotten me a whole tape recorder kit, uh, cassettes, that's everything. And I would dramatize comic books into these things. Do I get friends together? We, uh, that whole thing, like, you know, I got a barn, I got a flashlight, let's put on a show. And we would do these audio recreations of, of comic books. And that was just something I was, always loved. Uh, as an actor, I got into studying with uh, the groundlings and, uh, and just all kinds of uh, improvisation theater, uh, et cetera. But the sound things were something I was into. And I was on the Foley team for a film called House, made in 1984 uh, It was a horror film with Richard Mall uh, and. Uh, What's his name? William Cat. William Cat. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> William Cat. And they were doing these characters called the little, uh, the little critters. These little gremlin creatures that uh, came out this little boy. And I was working on the sound effects, and we were, we were stabbing watermelons with you know screwdrivers to get him hacking you know this monster. And uh, the director Steve Miner didn't have anyone to do the little critters, and I did them. I just I stood. <laughs> and they're like, that's it. Do that. And that's where it all started. And I've been doing a voice ever since. So, Dino, can we get a uh, AM? AM! Bravo! <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, and then me, my start was uh, just loving cartoons as a kid and learning about Mel Blanc and Fighter and all these, <laughs> all these classic Looney Tunes characters. And much like Dino, I had a cassette player who would do like mock uh, 
you know, audio plays and, and silly parody commercials and play like a DJ. I, I was fascinated by the idea of radio, so I loved, you know, The Shadow and War of the Worlds, but I also loved rock DJ stuff, so I ended up getting a broadcasting degree from the University of North Texas, had an internship at a radio network, and then while I was at the radio network in Dallas, I heard about auditions at Funimation for Dragon Ball Z, which I was already a fan of. I remember you guys in the mid-90s, before Cartoon Network yeah. was airing, the Canadian dub was airing once a week on Saturday mornings, 4 or 5 a.m., and then it came to Cartoon Network. Well, a year after Cartoon Network, heard about the auditions, went in totally as a fanboy, and then got booked doing bit parts, and then ultimately Team Gohan took over the narrator, took over Ox King, and some other, other big things. Everything's dominoed from that ever since, and uh, I feel very blessed to get to do this awesome type of work. So how, you guys, how important is it to be geeky to doing this kind of work? I mean, I know for myself, like, that's how it started. I was just destined to way too much time alone, had too many multiple personalities, had all kinds of conversations with myself. And, uh, and I, had, I had the ability, I can't do it today, I wish I could, but I had the ability, it was like, uh, I could hear sirens, I could do sirens at high decibels, and it would just completely freak my mother out, right? But I, at like three to five, I could do a siren with any country, ambulance, fire truck, police car, and if, and if ever I, that I felt like I wasn't getting something uh, from my mother buying me the toy or anything, I'd sit in the back seat and I'd suddenly hit the brakes and hear a siren, and my mother would freak her out. <laughs> and I thought that was just the most powerful thing in the world. You know, as a four-year-old, I could stop the car, you know, and it was great. But, uh, you know, I'm a pretty geeky guy. So how important was that to what we did? my son did again. Robin, you've been doing this the longest. How important is it to, to have the inner geek within? Yeah, the inner geek within. that factor into your passion? Sure. Sure. There's so many different parts you can play as a voiceover artist because you don't have to look the role. So uh, uh, you need to be able to tap into a lot of different, different personalities. Uh, you don't have to be schizophrenic. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm just getting over my own job, so to speak. But you have to tap into uh, inner channels of, of different characters, so it's feelable. The deeper the better. I have to agree with that. I mean, the the most important thing of all is to be a, a skilled actor. That's not because you've got to bring these characters to life. And if you're not a geek, but you're a skilled actor, you're 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 ahead of the game. But if you, if you are a geek, it gives you an advantage because more than any other discipline of acting, we live entirely in the Twilight Zone's dimension of imagination. We have nothing to inform our performances. We don't work on sets. We don't wear costumes. We don't carry props. We don't wear makeup. It all has to be in here. Being a lifelong fan of science fiction, horror, and fantasy, I'm already open to great works of imagination. And I found that to be terrific, uh, a, a terrific advantage. When I, when I work on World of Warcraft, they'll have these big, thick books of all kinds of reference material to show the actors. Because again, just because you're cast does not necessarily mean you're a geek, because they're looking for the most skilled actors they can find. I could be working on something like, this character's gonna take on this monster, it's a, it's a Cthulhu, let me show you these. Yeah, HP Lovecraft, I got that stuff. You know, okay, this character, he's like this, this villain, he's like a psychic, like Dreamer Warm Tongue from, Lord of the Rings, you know, let me show you a picture, Brad Dirk, yeah, I got a you know, It's like, I know these things already, but not everyone does, but that's okay, because again, at the end of the day, being a skilled actor is what matters. So, being a geek, being a fanboy, I have an advantage in that area, and I understand what the writers are creating and trying to do. That, pretty, that sounds like you're familiar with me. Yeah. Right across the board. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with, uh, you know, because as, as Dean was saying, when you when you approach an animation script, uh, you get the script nine months before the animation is even really locked in place. You know, so you're doing you're, you're, you've got to create this entire world. You know, your imagination is so um, at its peak, I guess, in that room because you're also informing. I think the other, you know the, the other thing is that you're informing the animators. Uh, uh, quite a lot about what they can do and and how they how they envision you know the the scenes going in visually 
because you know when, when you get in there and you get the script and they've already written it and they've got the stage directions and it, it looks very much like a TV script or a stage script or something along those lines, um, what ends up happening is usually you're just giving your lines on a page and sometimes with a scene, it just kind of depends on, on what they're doing. Um, and then you gotta create that world, you know? And so the, the more you are in tune with with that entire world of, of you know, uh, everything you grew up with, or whatever that may be, everything you're immersed in here, you know, all that kind of stuff, the better. Because as you were saying, you know, it's, you have to have those references. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say that it's, it's thievery, but to some degree it is, because you're basically, you know, when characters are, are created vocally, and, and you know, even visually sometimes, it's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of that. You can take a little bit of this guy over here and this guy over here, and you kind of match them all together. And you know, maybe it's Brad Dourif, but he's got a lisp and he's like 50 years older. You know, so that's kind of like how you might create that character. Yeah, I can put it in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and so so when you're doing that, you're you're creating a, an environment that they can that they can really see because uh, you know. We're, we're living in this wonderful new belief world, and we have to make it feel like it's real. Uh, I always I, I teach theater, and uh, I always tell the students uh, that I work with, I say, you have to create a believable reality on stage. There's really no different when you're behind the mic. You gotta create a believable reality, and whatever that may be, even if it's a goofy cartoon kind of voice, that's the reality for that world, so it's gotta be believable in that world, you know? And so you, you guys, I mean, you're going into professional recording environments, you, you know, film Foley studios, recording studios throughout Hollywood. Uh, for people getting started, <laughs> what tools are accessible to them today? Like what, you know, I mean, how many times have we heard, there's so many times on, on many different levels, people have hired over the years, reviewed portfolios, whatever it is, you know, they've always got financial excuses why, what they do and what makes them special stands in the way of me being able to know that when they're showing me something right on the spot. And so I'm curious, you know, what do you think the values of tools are for people getting started? They can show people that are accessible to them. I, I have one right now because I've been doing this for the longest time and I've literally booked series from recording underneath, a, you know, a thermal blanket. So That's my <laughs> I'm telling you, a, a snowball mic from Best Buy, USB input into a laptop with GarageBand, literally. I mean, that, that's as low end as it gets. It's a couple hundred bucks. Um, currently, my apartment makes a lot of noise, so I'm recording in my new Hyundai Elantra GT. <laughs> um, um, but literally, there are people do micro recorders that are really good, apparently. I don't know the names, maybe they do, but there's really no excuse. Yeah. If, if you've got the voice, you can get there. I actually did, uh, uh, Fox needed, I, I had recorded something, I left home, I, I was recording at home, I left home, and they called me, like, 45 minutes later, in a, in a panic, we, we completely forgot one tag, like coming, like coming tomorrow night on, you know, whatever. And and so I had Twisted Wave, which is an application in my iPhone, and I literally just put a blanket over my head in the car, recorded into my iPhone, sent it to them, they were like, it's perfect. I was telling that, it's a $10 app on an iPhone. <laughs> really? It's available on Android, but Twisted Wave, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a free app on, on desktop called Audacity, which is free and you get what you pay for, sometimes it crashes, but it's reliable, yeah. I use that at home. I use something called the Apogee mic, which plugs directly into iPhone, has a lightning connector. It also comes with a USB, it is a USB mic, so you can plug it into laptops and desktops and everything. Uh, your recording environment, obviously, you need something that's going to deaden the sound. So something like this where the voice is echoing off the walls, this would never be submittable as an audition. But something quiet, like a closet, something that absorbs sound, like boxes, clothes, putting a blanket over your head. Yep. You know, yeah, you look like an idiot, but I mean, it works. And it it works. sometimes, yeah, you need a car. Yeah, go to Target, get one of those rolling wardrobes, throw a furniture blanket over it, you got a bathroom. There you go. There you go. There's no reason why you have to spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to have a decent recording environment for an audition. For a session, yeah, it's a little more required here. You're but, but you're going to need the audition before you get to the session. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. So, but yeah, I mean, all the, the resources are out there. I mean, that's just it. It's, it's, it's such a, I think with technology, especially nowadays, I mean, it's so advanced that, yeah, you can do it almost anywhere. You just need a good environment and a decent enough mic that's going to make it sound Good, yeah. uh, and you know, with, with high quality. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've thrown the tree kit thing and took all the stuff out of it, and that's my case. And uh, 
and and I'll set up at a desk and clamp it in and hold the cover over my head and do the thing, pull it back, breathe a little bit, <laughs> and it, it works. Yeah. And so over the years, so uh, you know, I started laying voices to to tracks in '90, and Robin, you said you started in '80. And at that time, we didn't have the, these tools for accessibility, right? It was a little harder. No, it was uh, go to your agents, and they they have a studio uh, uh, recording. And you go audition with your agents. You can do it at home. And so today, if we're we're saying okay, so with the accessibility of low cost tools. Uh, you really don't have a prohibit. You don't have a reasonable prohibitor to say, "I just can't t tell you. Uh, I can't. I can't have you listen to what I do." So, if they are going to be showing people uh, material, having people listen, what should they put together with those tools that they do have access to? Well, first, I would say, uh, for me, I think get in a class. Yeah, get in a class. You know, I think because of the fact that it's also so accessible right now, you're up against tens of hundreds of thousands of people who have the same access, you know? Um, and the way to get past that is get training, you know, without some from that class. And the connections from that class, you know, you're gonna go to, the, in town here especially, there's, there's some great voiceover studios that uh, offer classes. You know, the casting places are kind of becoming a dying breed, but they're still there and they have great classes available uh, in, in those. Um, I teach you at Callenson. Counseling, Counseling, Voice Caster, um, Carol Casting, like there's a number of places. But I would say get in the class because you got to know what your voice can do. You got to know what you're capable of. You got to know how you sound behind a microphone. You know, when you get the headphones on, it does sound different than being that much more prepared. Yeah, you, know? you want to be as trained as possible. I mean, it's a completely different world. If Steven Spielberg is casting in a movie, who's going to get the lead in? You know, Johnny Depp or me? <laughs> Well, I'm not even getting it to read for the Steven Spielberg movie. It's going to be bad. But if it's a cornflakes commercial, who's going to get it? Me or Johnny Depp? Johnny Depp doesn't read for cornflakes commercials. But in the world of voiceover, uh, and I'm speaking strict, strictly on camera there, in the world of voiceover, however, um, it's not about our celebrity. Our, our, our experience, everything brings us all to the same table. And you're reading up against voiceovers equivalent of Johnny Depp or Tom Hanks or whatever, reading for the foreign place commercials. You, it, it's all about the best actor that you can yeah, It really is. You have to be as trained as possible. And so how important is the voice? You know, the voice, right? We all, we've all heard of the voice. Uh, the guy who does all the car I don't even know his name, but uh, the voice is what I would term to. How is it important to, to nurture the voice versus multiple personalities? versus having, you know, Kyle, you do a lot of, uh, you do a wide range of, of characters. How, how important do you think is the diversity of cast that you're presenting yourself as capable of doing? Uh, well, I mean, it's, I mean, here, here's the thing, a lot of people will, will, will come at this and they're trying to get in the industry going, well, you know, I don't have a million voices, so I'm not cut out to do this. It's like, but there are so many people who have their own niche thing. It's like there's people that use their natural speaking voice all the time and then they're able to make a lucrative career out of it. Other people get called in to, you, to do what they call the utility voices, you know, the background things. I frequently get calls for games and anime and everything to, to be the guy who fills in all the background characters because they gotta get the production done. They already had the main cast record. What's left? Soldier A and Demon C and all that. So, and a lot of us all come in for, for those things. We may come in for a major role, and then at the end of the session, they'll come in and have us do that. So, uh, having a wide range of acting uh, ability, of course, I think is far more key than having the voices thing because everyone has their their part. Everyone has something that they can do. And they'll always depend on that particular person to do it. And they're going to come to you for your strengths. So don't think that you have to, you have to be a jack of, of all trades to be a successful voice actor. Yeah. yeah, and I think nowadays too, I mean, at least I, you know, working commercially, it's so varied now that you know, they don't even want people who sound like they do voiceover. You know, the, the kind of the old school voiceover professional sound, that's out the window for the most part. So sounding like yourself, is a really good thing to some degree, you know, uh, certainly from a commercial standpoint, um, and even into promo sometimes now. So 
I think it's it's less, it's even become less important that, that the voice, you know, you hear a lot of people, great voice, you should do voiceover, and it's like, okay, what can you do with the voice? That's really ultimately what it is. It's not about your voice, not at all about your voice. It's about creating characters and making that character live off the page. It, if you can do many voices, if you're a multi-voice, I'm a multi-voice character actor, that's an advantage, but that doesn't have to be the only thing. Lorenzo Music, for God's sake. Everything Lorenzo Music did pretty much sounded like this, and my God, the man had one hell of a career. Okay, can I say something? Can I, yeah. Is there something that really annoys me about animated films? I see a raccoon or something, I see a character, and then I hear Bruce Willis. Right. <laughs> Honestly, that shit just pisses me off. As a, as a, as a fan voice, I'm like, no, where's Mel Blanc? You know, where's the people? That was the guy, right? Mel Blanc. You know, you guys mentioned him earlier, and that was my just, just complete mind blowing, you know, sort of uh, role model for. I'm not even sure what, because I never thought I'd be doing voices. I just did it because I was kind of an idiot and a clown, and, and it just came so naturally. And I like messing with people, and eventually. I, because I was doing animation, I found, you know, these need voices, and uh, it was just easier to do it on yourself if you knew what, it was, what was going on. At least it felt that way to me. Lauren, I think the same time every time I look at Seth Green. Really? <laughs> 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 you know, you talk about the voice, too, and how if you guys want to get started in the business. There also is the business aspect that you also have to be aware of. Like, you can be, you know, I, I have a thin nasally voice. It's never going to change. I'm never going to do something that Kyle does. But I'm really good on social media. I'm good on Facebook. I send emails. I, I, I sent a blind email the other day and said, hey, I hear you're doing this. I'd love to work on it. And I booked the part. So you also have to be a tenacious business person in, in addition to being a good actor and, and skilled with your instrument. But don't be afraid. You know, be, be brave as well. I think it's really important. If you don't ask for something, no one's going to give it to you. So, Brian, so. Uh you, you said you're working, you've worked with Disney, you've worked with Fox, you've yeah. worked with uh, uh, the, the elevators, theater groups, right. the, you know, elevators, <laughs> and, but you work with that age. Yes. So how does that work? How do, you get into the big, how do you get into the big studios when you don't have an age? My friend John Cavanaugh is writing the music for Sophia the First. He and I worked work together at Universal Studios in the Beetlejuice show. Or it's when you're a thousand years old, like I am, like you, you know people, you know what I mean? It helps, and again, people want to work with you, you want to be a good guy, you want to be a good business person, fast, responsible. So um, it is more difficult without having an agent, you know? But so far I'm doing okay, as long as they pay me for the day. <laughs> Do you know <laughs> Yes. Dominic, you've got an agent? Yeah. Yeah. Dino's got an agent. Dominic's got an agent. Kyle. Yeah. 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 Robin. Do you have an agent? Yeah. 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 You have an agent. So, so we don't agents. have agents. Yeah. So the, we're not get, They're not getting the ten percent of the stuff. The other sort of, <laughs> yeah. we're not making. Yeah. Ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how do you feel about giving? Uh, is it ten percent that your agents are getting, guys? Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about? And what they get? Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. They have to get the, the job. Uh -huh. They get the right. job themselves. Yeah. They don't see it. Yeah. 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 In the industry contacts, I, the same with me. I, I, most of the work I book is through industry contacts, but it's still advantageous because I don't have access to, to top level studio, Warner Brothers, Disney type, um, you know, auditions. I wish it worked that way, but this is not that simple. <laughs> So What's that? It's just basically scale, capacity, need, quickness. They just don't want to deal with a bunch of individuals. They'd rather call one agency and say, send us your best of this. Exactly. Yeah. It's convenient. yeah, and I also think that, I, I think when you're, you know, uh, right inside, I think the, the industry, I, I think ideal is, you know, they think, it, you know, I mean, by going to an agency or a management, you know, yeah. company, they know they're going to get what they're looking for. You know, I think that's the thing too, is that, you know, I mean, you've obviously been incredibly successful, and that's that's great. And I think that the, the tricky thing is, you know, when those projects come about, you know, they don't have time to go through the thousands of submissions they may get that are just kind of on the way because they don't know where, like, which ones to believe. And do I spend my time listening to this one over here, this one over here? But if they go to these top five agencies, I'm going to get 25 auditions total. <laughs> They know that they can book one of those 25, probably. You know, most, most likely. Even within those agencies, there's the upper echelon of people that are booking, so you can have an agent and still be struggling and scraping mm -hmm. to get the calls. So, I used to be with CAA. I wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it varied. 
There's yeah. a question back there. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not a question. I oh. don't want to sound like a lawyer or agent. Um, Me, Brian? Yeah, I mean, what you do is great. Yeah. Getting a job with them again is perfect. Yeah. But the right channel for you guys to get a job is through an agent. And you don't have a No, I agree. Do you have, can I have your card? Oh no! Yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand the path. It's just yeah. got a big wall there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if someone did stuff. Oh yeah, I've had one. Uh, it's better than Canadian. It's what you do. Yeah. You know, the right channel to have. For sure. So if you were I young just and you're getting so thank you. And if you were young and you're getting started and you start to pull this together, this material, how do you even go about getting in front of an agent? Because that could be as hard as getting in front of the, uh, the job, right? Yeah. Anybody? No, that's what I say. See, we were right, right off our We're being, we're being uh, uh, live streamed. So yeah, right? yeah, 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 my, my, my path was not typical. Uh, I, I had a friend who was auditioning for something and she wanted. Uh, she wanted to do it as a partner read and asked me if I would read with her. Uh, so we read together, it was submitted, and then the agent asked her, is that guy represented? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know what happened to her, but oh. they, they, they called me and asked if I would read for this animated turtle. For this, this, this guy, his name was Sheldon. He was his whole title, you see, and I read for Sheldon. And the agent called me back and, and said, are you, do you, do you, are you represented at all? I said, no. He said, you are now. <laughs> and so, yeah, so my, I didn't submit or it was just, it just happened. What were you so, doing at the time? At the time, uh, I was doing a lot of audio production. I was doing a lot of, uh, so just by having a friend just, who was doing it, being in the right just, place, right time, right place, and having right your voice time. on. Yeah. You flipped that it on, it. someone heard it, and that was that's it. what happened. There's a lot of people that, uh, I don't think I got them started in careers, but I used the voice at different times. Because I would walk around the studio and we had lots of animators and things like that. And I remember uh, Jim Henson. Right? And then the Muppets and the Henson, you know, uh, those people weren't just puppeteers, but they did the voices for the things that they typically animated. So I had this, uh, this unrealistic idea that, well, if you were animating it, you should do the voice as well. You know? So that went over really well with animators. But then they'd walk around the studio and people would start doing their little, hey, I got this going on. And they're playing their little voices, and some of them would be great. And I'd say, you, you're getting in the booth. And, and then all of a sudden, it's stage fright, right? right? So now that you can hear this, they don't think anyone's really paying attention, and they do fabulous voices, but then they get in front of the mic, and what happens? And, and then they freeze up because they feel like people are watching, they feel self-conscious now, and that doesn't lead to very good voice acting, right? So, uh, and that's uh, apparently about the number one public fear is public speaking in front of right? Yeah. So, so how does that happen? So it's one thing, you might do great voices, you know, in the shower, and you might cut together great real voices, but then you're gonna go in and you're gonna audition, and, and now the lights are on, you're being watched, how's that? How do you deal with that? It's training. It, it comes down to training, and just mm -hmm. having done it so much that it becomes fun. You just try to have fun. And nail the character and try to have fun. I do a lot of on camera auditions and it's the same thing. Uh, you go in there, you make a, make a couple of friends, and you have fun with the character. You get the part fine. If you don't, well, it's their loss. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and that's the name of the game. Yeah. Training for sure. You know, I, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I teach theater and. Uh, you know, I always, we always tell the students who, who are rehearsing or auditioning for anything that, that, that they're doing, it's, you know, approach it as if that's the job. And then when you get paid to do the job, it's even more fun. <laughs> you know, but start looking at it that way and put yourself in, those, in, that, in that position. And that's kind of one of the ways to kind of, to, to get past that frightful thing is ownership. You know, but as 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 he was saying over there, it's like, you know, it's training, it's rehearsal. You know, sometimes you don't get an opportunity to rehearse something very much in, in our line of work. You know, you How often do you feel that you're just laid right on the spot? With that? Ninety, a lot. 90 <laughs> plus percent of the time. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah, usually you're going to be given a script, whatever that is, and 
you know, like a commercial, or whatever. They'll just hand it to you right there, and you'll have they'll just throw you in the booth, and then off you go, and, and then you start playing with them. I always kind of like, like if you have the job already, I always kind of look at it and go, I already have a gig. They're like what I do, so pressure gone, right? That pressure's out. Now I can just play with the producers or whoever's in there, you know, the creative people in the room because I already got the game. Like, you know, I mean, I guess I could lose it by really sucking, but you know, <laughs> I, you know, I've already gotten that opportunity to be there. Because and you know what? If you if that happens to you, if you do lose a job, and you know, it does not mean that's the end of your career. Right. Right. You know, I. I I learned to have as a life model that I have the option to fail, but never to quit. Hmm. By knowing that, I know that any time I fail, it's a learning experience. I have to learn from it and move on. And, and, and that's why when I hear somebody say, failure is not an option, I think, oh, there, it's so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> because the first time you fail, you'll think that's it, it's over. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, and it's such a competitive field that, you know, the odds of you getting hired are pretty staggering. Like, Say you might get hired for one out of every hundred things you audition for. Sometimes it's that ludicrous. It's that, you know, and you think to yourself, okay, oh my God. But you do the best you can in each audition because think of it as, oh, hey, I'm one closer to that one. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, oh, they're never going to hire me. Because your lack of confidence will come through in the audition. Yeah. You have to go in there and treat the audition as the job. You have to love it so much and showcase to that casting person why they should hire you, because even if they don't hire you for that project, they'll see the passion in your eyes, how, how well you take direction and how good you are because you've taken your acting classes and everything, that they'll remember you, put a little asterisk next to your name and call you in, you'll be on their short list for the auditions in the future. That's worth its weight in gold, yes. more so than just booking the part. I mean, I, I, know, I know producers that I've worked with who I auditioned for multiple times, maybe I worked with them once a couple years ago, and, and you know, they kind of, go away and you don't really hear from them and then you get a job and you go in the studio and you're like, oh hey, I remember you. And they're like, yeah, I had your name on my list. I've been looking for something to get you involved in and you've auditioned for me like 12 times for other projects. It just wasn't right for the clients. But, you know, I kept throwing your name in the ring every single time because, you know, you're a fun person to work with, you know, and that that's, as, as Kyle was saying, like, it's, you know, you never, you never, you, can, you never know what somebody's going to be doing in this business. You know, some one day they're an animator, next day they're they're the directing the session. Mm -hmm. You know, one day they're uh, you know answering phones at the ad agency, next mm -hmm. thing they're the top creative director, and yeah. they're hiring everybody to, to be in their commercial. You know, so you don't know. You know, and and this is such a fun business. Like I don't know why why carry any animosity and negativity yeah. into it. Yeah. So I've fun. had exactly that <laughs> same experience where I, I there was one company that was like, my God, I cannot break in with these people. Why am I being mad? And then finally I booked a gig with them and the producers were saying, oh my God, we, we loved your auditions. We wanted to bring you in, but just one thing after another, we're so glad that, to have you in here. And here I'm thinking these people hate me. I they never been here. Right. And now I find out, you know, oh my God, they, they've always wanted to bring you in. That's, that's wonderful, you know. I mean, and you think about, you know, Brian Cranston when he said, I used to think that my job was to get a job. And it's not. That's the job of the casting director, the producer, and those guys who give you a job. He said, and I absolutely agree with him, my job is to create a compelling character. That's it. <laughs>